Hello, welcome back. You know, the universe around us is truly incredible. One of my goals is to learn something new every single day. And with that in mind, here are six amazing science facts to spark your curiosity. Fact number one, there are more trees on Earth than stars in our galaxy. There are significantly more trees on Earth than stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is named the Milky Way, and it's a spiral galaxy that's approximately 100,000 light years in diameter and contains an estimated 400 billion stars. In contrast, the Earth is a terrestrial planet with a diameter of only 12,741 miles and an estimated 3 trillion trees. So the diameter of our galaxy is about 75 trillion times larger than the Earth. So how can there be more trees on the Earth? Well, it's because the average distance between trees on our planet is on the order of meters, whereas the average distance between stars in space is about five light years. In summary, space is really, really big. Fact number two, most of the oxygen on the Earth comes from the oceans. Most of the oxygen on Earth is produced by photosynthesizing organisms, primarily cyanobacteria and algae, which are found in the oceans as well as in other aquatic environments such as rivers, lakes, and damp soil. These organisms use energy from sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose, which is a type of sugar, and oxygen through the process of photosynthesis. The oxygen is then released into the atmosphere as a byproduct of this process. Now, the oceans cover about 70% of the Earth's surface, and they're home to a vast array of photosynthesizing organisms, including cyanobacteria and algae. These organisms are found in a variety of environments, including the oceans, and also surface waters in the photic zone, which is the top layer of the ocean where there's enough sunlight for photosynthesis to actually occur. They're even found in the deep sea. In particular, cyanobacteria are found in a variety of environments, including oceans, lakes, and damp soil. They're often found in large blooms, especially in nutrient-rich water, such as those found in estuaries and near the mouths of rivers. Algae are a diverse group of aquatic organisms that are able to carry out photosynthesis and are also found in oceans, lakes, and rivers. The abundance of water, nutrients, and sunlight in the oceans make them an ideal photosynthesizing habitat for organisms, which is why the oceans are a major source of oxygen on the Earth. Fact number three, many animals use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. Many animals, including birds, fish, and some mammals, are able to use Earth's magnetic field to navigate and sense direction. They do this through the use of special structures in their body that are sensitive to magnetic fields, such as magnetite crystals in the beaks of some birds and the lateral line system found in fish. Birds are known to use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate during migration. They have special cells in their brains called magnetoreceptors and are sensitive to magnetic fields. When the bird senses the direction of the magnetic field, it adjusts its course accordingly. Fish also have magnetoreceptors, which they use to orient themselves and navigate underwater. Some mammals, such as bats and certain species of mole rats, also have the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field. Bats use their magnetoreceptors to navigate and locate prey, while mole rats use them to orient themselves in underground tunnels. The ability to sense and use the Earth's magnetic field helps animals to orient themselves and navigate in their environment, allowing them to find food, mates, and suitable habitats. Fact number four, bananas are radioactive. Bananas contain a small amount of naturally occurring radioactive isotopes, as do many other living things and natural materials. One of the isotopes found in bananas is potassium-40, which is a naturally occurring radioactive isotope of potassium. Potassium-40 makes up approximately 0.01% of the total potassium found in nature, and it's present in a small amount of a variety of foods, including bananas, as well as in the human body. Potassium-40 decays into calcium-40 through a process called beta decay, emitting a very small amount of radiation in the process. 
It's important to note that the radiation emitted by the decay of potassium-40 and other naturally occurring isotopes is very, very low and poses no health risk at all. It's not possible to get radiation sickness from consuming bananas or other foods that contain naturally occurring radioactive isotopes. The levels of radiation that we are exposed to from consuming these foods are minuscule and they pose no significant health risk. In fact, the human body is constantly exposed to background radiation from a variety of sources, including the sun and the earth, and our bodies have evolved to be able to withstand and repair the damage caused by this radiation. The levels of radiation that we're exposed to from consuming bananas or other foods containing naturally occurring radioactive isotopes are minuscule compared to the amount of radiation that we are exposed to on a daily basis from other sources. Now I'd like to add to that that I was curious, how many bananas would you have to eat in order to actually get sick? Well, it turns out that to die from radiation poisoning from eating bananas, you would have to eat one billion bananas, billion with a B, billion bananas. I don't think you're gonna be able to find that many bananas, much less eat them all. And so I don't think you're going to get sick or die from radiation poisoning from bananas. And just to add to it a little bit further, to explain a little bit further, what's going on with the bananas is they contain an isotope called potassium-40. Basically, it's a potassium atom that has an extra neutron in the nucleus. Remember, neutrons don't have any charge, they're neutral. They just add weight to the nucleus. That's called an isotope. But the extra neutron causes the nucleus of that potassium uh, isotope to be a little bit unstable. So after a period of time, the extra neutron naturally decays. And when it decays, it emits what we call, it's called beta decay. It emits a beta particle, which is just an electron. So it emits an electron from the nucleus of the potassium isotope, and also an antineutrino. An antineutrino is the antimatter particle of the neutrino, which is another uh, particle we'll talk about another day in atomic physics. So what's going on is the nucleus emits an electron along with an antineutrino, and then that neutron, the extra neutron that was in the potassium nucleus, it turns into, after this decay, it turns into a proton. And when you look in the periodic table right next to calcium with one extra proton, I'm sorry, right next to potassium with one extra proton, you end up in calcium. That's why the potassium-40 isotope decays and goes up in the periodic table to calcium because one of its extra neutrons changes itself into a proton after decaying the electron and the antineutrino. All right, so that's how the decay actually works. The only other thing I'll add is that the half-life for this uh, beta decay process uh, for the uh, potassium into the calcium is over a billion years. So that means it's a very slow decay process. So the bananas sitting on your counter are constantly uh, emitting these particles and decaying all the time very, very, very slowly. But again, it's such a low, low, low dose and we're constantly exposed to radiation in our environment that you would have to eat over a billion bananas to actually die from eating bananas due to radiation sickness. Fact number five, a large cloud can weigh a million pounds. The weight of a cloud can vary greatly depending on its size, shape, and the type of particles it contains. Some clouds are very small and weigh only a few pounds, while others are much, much larger and can weigh hundreds, thousands, or even up to a million pounds for the largest clouds. This means that the largest clouds are about as heavy as the world's largest passenger jetliner when it's fully loaded of cargo and passengers. Clouds are formed when moist air rises and cools, and the water vapor in the air condenses into tiny droplets or ice crystals. The weight of a cloud is determined by the amount of water vapor and other particles that it contains. The weight of a cloud can also vary over time as it grows and dissipates, or as it moves through the atmosphere and encounters different weather conditions. It's difficult to accurately measure the weight of a cloud as they're constantly changing and they're not a solid object. However, meteorologists and other scientists use a variety of techniques such as radar and satellite imagery to study clouds and better understand their properties and behavior. Fact number six, hot water can freeze faster than cold water. The Mpemba effect is a phenomenon in which hot water can freeze faster than cold water under certain conditions. 
This effect was first observed by the Tanzanian student Erasto Mpemba in the 1960s, and it's been the subject of scientific study and debate ever since. The Mpemba effect has been demonstrated under certain conditions, but it's not a universal phenomena, and it does not always occur. In general, the freezing time of water will depend on a variety of factors, including the initial temperature of the water, the size and the shape of the container, and the presence of any dissolved substances or impurities in the water. The exact mechanism behind the Mpemba effect is not fully understood, and there are a few different theories that have been proposed to explain it. One theory is that hot water can evaporate more quickly than cold water, which removes some of the heat from the water and allows it to cool more quickly. Another theory is that hot water might contain more dissolved gas microbubbles, which can remain suspended as the water cools and accelerate the freezing process. Despite the Mpemba effect's apparent counterintuitive nature, it's been demonstrated in a number of scientific studies and has been reproduced in the laboratory. However, further research is needed to fully understand the underlying cause of this phenomenon. Now, personally, I find the Mpemba effect extremely interesting. All right, the common sense would tell you that if an object, a bucket of water is already cold, and you have another second bucket of water that's warmer, and you put them both in the freezer, that uh, the bucket of water that has the cold water should freeze faster than the bucket of water that has the hot water. But sometimes that does not happen. And again, as I said, it's not always reproducible. It has been reproduced in the lab, but only under certain conditions, and it's a poorly understood effect. I hope you've enjoyed these six amazing facts of science and nature, and most importantly, I hope it sparked your curiosity in science.